Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Sharon Bonney. I'm the CEO for the Coalition on Adult Basic Education, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our webinar today, Distance Learning During the Pandemic, Understanding Performance Assessment and Reporting. I first just wanted to take a quick detour and talk about our CoAve journal. As many of you know, we have launched a new CoAve journal, which focuses on workforce, and that is available on Shopify and Amazon. You can go to coave.org and check that out. There's a lot of really great interviews we're working on with the authors as well, and those are available at our website as well. Additionally, um, every participant of our webinar receives a certificate of participation. It comes to you within 24 hours, and all the slides and resources will be available in our adult educator repository within 48 hours. I also just wanted to quickly mention that we have been delivering these professional development webinars now um, hundreds and hundreds of them over the course of the last few years, but what's so interesting is over the, the course of the last few months, we've had more than 30,000 enrollments. And really our goal has been to provide a targeted professional development during this COVID-19 crisis. I also wanted to quickly mention that we have our national conference coming up July or June 29th um, through July 9th. We're gonna have July 4th weekend off, of course. And if you're registered, you can bring a guest free of charge. So go to coave.org for more details. And finally, the star of our show today, Ms. Cheryl Keenan. I'm delighted to welcome her. And I'm going to read a short bio here. I stop sharing my screen and pull this up. So Cheryl Keenan is director of the U.S. Department of Education Division of Adult Education and Literacy in the Office of Career, Technical, and Adult Education. In her role as a national director, she oversees the office, which funds almost $600 million in state and local grant programs to enable adults to improve their literacy and basic skills, complete high school, transition to post-secondary education and training, and succeed as workers, parents, and citizens. She's responsible for overseeing the Adult Education National Programs account, including resources to assist further development of the field of adult education and literacy. Prior to her appointment as the U.S. Department of Education in June 2002, she served as the Pennsylvania State Director of Adult Education and Literacy, where she developed Pennsylvania's first state-funded family literacy program, supporting literacy of parents and their young children. During her tenure in Pennsylvania, she also held positions in the Bureau of Special Education. Ms. Keenan holds undergraduate and graduate degrees in the field of education, has performed fieldwork in the area of, of early childhood special education, and served on numerous committees to advance education of children and adults. So with that, I now turn this over to Cheryl Keenan. Cheryl. Thank you so much, Sharon. Um, and I really wanna thank COE for the wonderful opportunity that you're providing to the US Department of Education today um, to be able to reach so many local adult education programs. You know, in my office, we deal a lot with state offices um, because states are the grantees of uh, the money that we administer. Um, but to have the opportunity to reach out directly to local program directors and teachers is an incredible um, opportunity, especially in these times of COVID around some topics that we know um, have a lot of questions attached to them. So thank you, Sharon. And I really appreciate the invitation to do this uh, webinar today. So next, um, um, we have with us Jay LaMaster. Um, Jay is our branch chief for accountability. And Jay is going to help us today um, in doing a facilitated question and answer period at the end of the webinar. We will be using the question box feature in Zoom, and you may post questions as we move through the webinar. We will not take questions as we go along, but we will answer questions at the end of the presentation. And I'm hoping that we can move through the presentation portion to leave a good amount of time to try to answer your questions. Next slide, um, I had planned to use a chat box to tell us um, where you are, but I see that everybody did that when you logged in and I read scrolled and scrolled and scrolled of 800 people. So I think we can skip this slide. And I have a nice little warm up activity for us on the next slide, Jay, if you want to advance. Next slide, please. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm it. Okay. Um, so what one word or phrase would you use to describe your current state of mind about your program or your teaching right now during the pandemic? Let's see what we have. And you can use the chat box to do that. 
um, and I see uh, improving, um, overwhelmed, adjusting, inadequate, open, insecure, evolving, confusion. Look at those adjectives scrolling through. It's a new normal. It's discombobulated. It's challenging, it's hopeful, it's hectic, it's chaotic. These are all of the feelings that are going on, not only um, in the adult ed program in the United States, but I'm sure globally. Um, so we certainly are not in this alone. Um, if I do a little switch here and I ask you the second question, and I think this one's interesting. Um, if you asked your students the same question from a student perspective, what do you think the adjectives that your students would use? What do you think your students would say? Now, well, do we have to wait till all those 800 go through before we start seeing student responses? Crazy, anxiety, overwhelming, the same. Uh, disconnected and isolated. Weird, thankful, difficult, hard to understand. Thankful, different, but functional. My students really like Zoom classes. Different, impatient, horrible. Different, multitasking, uncomfortable. Glad to connect. Yuck. <laughs> so these are, um, these, these answers show that you are very tuned in to your students. Um, and there is a range of emotions, not only for educators, at this point in time, but also for our students. And I think it's really important um, to keep our students in mind and what they're feeling as we advance um, you know, through these stages of COVID. Okay, the next slide. So with the, past, with the fast pivot to distance learning, Octe has worked to provide clarifications and flexibilities to the field about how distance learning is reported in the NRS. So through town halls and conversations with various groups and with states, we identified some main questions asked by adult educators at both the state and local levels. This webinar provides some foundational information that sets the groundwork for clarification and flexibilities that Octe has provided through a series of frequently asked questions, which are posted in the COVID space on the ed.gov website. Today, I will present this information in an easy to understand format to facilitate a greater understanding of reporting and accountability requirements for distance learners in the context of the pandemic. At the end of the presentation, Jay will facilitate a question and answer forum using the question box feature in Zoom. So we were just using the chat box for the questions and answers. We're gonna ask you to switch to the question box. I know you may have all kinds of questions and some of them we will be able to answer and others we may not be able to answer. We are most prepared to answer questions about reporting and accountability requirements related to the content we cover in the webinar. Please feel free to post your questions as we move through the webinar and we will answer them at the end. Next slide. So I'm gonna start with the foundation. This is some foundational information um, to help us to put into context some of the questions when we get to them. Next slide, please. Federal funds to support adult basic ed and English language acquisition are appropriated through the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. The act itself establishes six core indicators of performance that pertain to adult education, vocational rehabilitation, as well as four programs administered by the U.S. Department of Labor the adult program, the, dis the dislocated worker program, and the youth program, all under Title I, as well as the Wagner-Pizer program that provides unemployment insurance services. Adult education participants that accumulate at least 12 hours of instruction are measured against these indicators. The first three indicators may be tracked by the state using a data match or as a local program, you may be following up on these indicators yourself. The credential attainment indicator includes both secondary school credentials and post-secondary credentials, and only certain learners are included in these measures. All learners are measured in the measurable skill gain indicator. This may be the indicator you are most involved in at the local level, and we'll talk more about this indicator in a little bit. The effectiveness in serving employers indicator is still in a pilot phase, and it's a shared indicator among 
the WIOA partner programs. When it comes to performance, WIOA requires the state to be accountable to the federal office for meeting established targets on each indicator. In turn, states put in place their own requirements with local programs to help them meet their federal targets. It's important to recognize that state to local policies vary among states. What your state requires of you as a local program may not be the same as what a, an adult education program in another state must follow. So that's an important distinction and one that we will keep on reinforcing through today's webinar. Next slide, please, Jay. So more on measurable skill gain. Because, um, because the performance indicators apply to six different federal programs that offer different services to meet the varying needs of program participants, skill gain measures may be different for federal programs based on the different types of services that they provide. To accommodate this, there are five ways that WIOA programs may measure skill gain. Only the first two types of gain can be used to measure skill gain of an adult education participant. The other three types of gain are used, for example, for youth who are still enrolled in secondary school or for participants who are placed in a work-based program with an employer, such as an apprenticeship program, or who are receiving job training. Next slide, please. Educational functioning level gain, or what we call in adult education, EFL gain, has been used in adult education programs for more than 20 years. But under WIOA, we have the opportunity to expand the ways a student can obtain an educational functioning level. And these expanded options went into effect three or four years ago. Programs may measure skill gain through educational functioning level option by either comparing initial educational functioning level as measured by a pretest with the, participation, with the participants educational functioning level as measured by a post test, probably the one that we are most familiar with that we have used historically over the years. Uh, we can also advance a student in an educational level by awarding credits or Carnegie units and that applies to state, states that offer adult high school programs that lead to a secondary school diploma or its recognized equivalent. Or we can also show it by in, if a student enrolls in a post-secondary education and training during the program year, if that participant exits the program uh, below the post-secondary level. So if they leave adult education and advance into a post-secondary education or training program, that also constitutes educational functioning level gain under WIOA. So now there are ways to advance a student under the EFL method other than pre and post testing. Although admittedly, the ways are most suited to students at higher levels. Next slide, please. This gives you an easy, hopefully an easy visual. A measurable skill gain for adult education can be achieved through an educational functioning level or through high school completion. If you're using the educational functioning level option, there are three ways that you can show an EFL gain by a pre and post test, by credit completion, or by entering post-secondary education. And I do wanna come back and say that another way, high school completion allows you to count a gain on the passage of a high school equivalency test or award of a secondary school diploma without an NRS approved pretest. So this is something we heard strongly from the field as a barrier to showing your outcomes for students. And this is accommodated in our current NRS. Next slide, please. There's one more piece of foundational information that's important to understand. Uh, and these are the regulations governing how NRS tests are approved and must be used by states to register an EFL gain when you are using that type of gain to show a student obtained a measurable skill gain. First, the regulations. And these regulations are at 34 CFR 
Part 462. Uh, CFR, for your information, is the Code of Fed Federal Register. So these are department regulations and they're found in at Part 462, but I'm going to make it real short and easy for you. Um, they cover two main, these, this set of uh, regulations requires two main requirements. First, they set forth the process that test makers must follow when they want a test considered for approval for use in the NRS. This includes the test undergoing a rigorous psychometric review prior to approval. Once the test is approved, it goes on a list of NRS approved tests that a state may consider using. Not all states allow all approved tests and not all states use the same tests. Again, there's a good deal of variations among the states. The second set of requirements, the second set of requirements is most pertinent to the webinar today. I'm getting little pop-ups here. Uh, the regulations must, uh, the regulations require each state to have in place an assessment policy that describes the tests that it's going to allow in its state. And the policy must also include the test administration procedures that must be followed in administering pre-test and post-test. When using NRS test option emphasized to advance an EFL. Again, the federal requirement related to using an NRS approved test is solely for measuring an EFL using the test option. Some states require, require NRS tests for other purposes, like eligibility determinations, but these are not federal requirements. Again, your state assessment policies vary from state to state, and please keep that in mind as we move through the webinar, because ultimately, you need to know what your state's assessment policy requires, and you need to follow that policy. Next slide, please. So here's a short story. Octa approves tests for use in the NRS. States determine which tests they're gonna use and um, develops a state assessment policy. The policies vary across states and the policies only govern how a student is placed in an educational functioning level and moves to another educational functioning level when you're using the NRS approved test option under measurable skill gain. The regulations apply only to that. Short story, end of enough. Next slide, please. Okay, now the pivot to distance education. Now that we've covered some foundational information, it's time to talk more about distance education. The adult education system made a tremendous pivot to 100% distance services when organizations closed their doors to classroom instruction as the pandemic hit. As a system, we had been using distance learning for some time, although many programs were favoring hybrid models that combined classroom and distance learning. And some teachers who had not been involved in distance education prior found themselves teaching 100% remote. I know the stress these changes must have had on program staff, and I want to commend you all for your commitment to making your programs work for learners in these unprecedented times. Next slide, please. We've tried to keep tuned in to what states and local programs need during the pandemic. Now let's hear from you. Um, I have some questions that we did answer, but what are your biggest challenges in delivering distance education? Uh, if you switch to your chat box function and put them in there, uh, let's just take a look. Retention, student connectivity, the digital divide, we hear that a lot. Available technology, we hear that a lot. Testing, student engagement, you have to be a fast reader, equity, Testing, technology, frustration, internet access. Students who don't respond to attempts to contact them. Childcare for learners. Instructors, digital skills, distractions, illness, illness. It's like herding cats. Lack of access to GED after they're done with their instruction. Students' phone or internet being reliable. Invalid phone numbers. Retention, they just give up. Coordination, no internet. 
there certainly are many, many problems that you're facing. Okay, thank you. And we will be able to keep this chat box um, to see what all of the comments are saying. Okay, next slide, please. So here's some of the main questions we heard that were particularly related to uh, accountability and reporting uh, when we did our, rate, our, our outreach efforts. We answered these concerns with clarifications and flexibilities in three separate frequently asked question releases. And I have links to those at the end of the webinar. We heard things like, what if we can't do face-to-face -face testing? How do we report hours? How can we enroll new students? How can we report distance without a pretest? And how can we measure skill gains without a test? So on the next slide, we'll start talking about some of these things. First, um, you know, the first cry that we heard was um, that states as well as local programs were concerned about missing performance targets for measurable skill gains that were established for program year 2019. That's the year that started in July of 2019 and ends in just a few days. We reminded states that 2019, program year 2019 data, that is the data that states will submit to OCTAE on October 1 of 2020, will not be used to calculate performance and determine success or failure against the established MSG target. This was true prior to the pandemic because the federal office does not have at least two years of data available that is required to perform these performance calculations. So there are no penalties for missing targets on the data that's submitted in this coming October. For program year 2020 that starts in just a few days, no one knows what the impact of the pandemic will have on our programs, but we will ensure that any assessment of state performance will be objectively fair, considering the COVID virus. Next slide, please. The ability to administer NRS approved tests to measure educational functioning level gain is greatly impacted um, by pandemic related program closures. We understand that spring is a time when many local programs schedule their post testing and that the closures may have resulted in not getting those post tests. To address the concern, we are providing flexibility to states to revise their assessment policies to allow for testing exemptions for students in distance education programs during the pandemic. We provided what we call prior approval of those changes to states so that the states could make the exemptions available to you quickly. We do understand that exempting students from testing may have an adverse effect on performance reporting. So we ask states to address the effect in their annual state narrative reports so that as a system, we can address the impact of the pandemic. And remember, there are no federal penalties for performance in program year 2019. Of course, as we covered, the foundational, as we covered in the foundational information previously, states have their own policies on local performance, and they may vary also from state to state. These could be policies related to how the state funds you as a local program based on your performance or based on your enrollment. Um, so OCTE took the opportunity to encourage states to review those policies in light of the pandemic and to allow flexibility during the time of the pandemic um, where it is affecting local program operations. Next slide, please. We also heard many questions about how to report hours of instruction on distance learners. Uh, reporting instructions for distance learners had been in place for more than a decade. And in our last year's data, states reported serving over 55,000 students in distance learning programs. Before the pandemic, many local programs offered distance learning in combination with classroom instruction, referred to as hybrid models. A student enrolled in a hybrid program can only be counted one time. And states have flexibility in setting the rules for whether a student is counted as a classroom learner or as a distance learner. So there was flexibility there and people may have different rules that they're following on this. For students that are be being reported as distance students, states are not required to report instructional hours in the NRS. However, some states want to collect hours of instruction at the local level to help determine when testing should occur. 
In our NRS reporting guidelines, we developed several ways states could collect and report on hours using something called proxy hours, where actual instructional hours are not available. This is an area where states have differing rules on reporting, so it's important for you to consult with your state office to understand what is required in your state. As a service to a state and local programs, we created something that we're calling a tip sheet um, that gathered all of the information in the NRS reporting guide into one easy to use summary of reporting requirements on distance upon distance. The tip sheet link is provided here um, and it and pro provides instructions on how to use proxy hours as well as other information that you would find useful. I don't have enough time to review that but it is a very easy to follow tip sheet that's only about a page and a half long. And I, if you have not yet seen it, I would urge you to review that tip sheet. Next slide, the 12 hour rule. Even though states are not required to report hours of instruction for distance learners, all learners must accumulate 12 contact hours before they can be considered a program participant. The 12 hour rule as it's known allows local programs to count intake, orientation, and assessment towards the initial 12 hours. And for distance students, that contact may be virtual in nature. So even though the, uh, the hours do not need to be reported in the NRS, those initial 12 hours should be documented so that the local program can demonstrate that a student is actually a program participant for federal purposes. This slide gives you a little flow chart um, which shows how the 12 hour rule works, covering the points that I just made. Next slide, please. Before the pandemic, in-person assessment at a secure proctored site that met the state's assessment policy was required to administer an NRS approved test. But a lot has changed in the world of virtual assessment since this policy was put in place. And the pivot to 100% remote instruction gave us an opportunity to revisit that policy. So at Octe, we met with test publishers of NRS approved tests and determined that it may be feasible for their tests to be administered virtually. We expanded the options for administering NRS approved tests by adding an option to administer them virtually if the maker of the, that test has established procedures for virtual administration of it. Test makers will address such procedures related to proper identification of the student, test security, technology requirements, proctor training requirements, and procedures for retesting should a test session be interrupted. This is an exciting advancement in the future of distance learning for adult education. We know that virtual testing is not an easy lift and that programs must overcome issues related to technology access and other challenges. But we look forward to working through these challenges with you because we believe in the end, it will make a permanent difference and advance the field of adult education. Next slide, please. Okay, when the pivot to 100 remote instruction happened, most programs converted classes for already enrolled learners to distance settings. But programs were uncertain about whether they could enroll new students, and if so, how? We already clarify that orientation and intake can be conducted virtually, and that paves the way for enrolling new students. But some programs had questions about enrolling a new student without an NRS approved pretest. In our FAQ series, we clarified that new students can be enrolled in distance learning programs without an NRS approved pretest. You must, of course, have a way to determine that a student is an eligible student for the adult education program. If that determination was previously done using an NRS test, you will need to find another way to determine eligibility. Depending on your state, you may follow your state's guidance on how to do that, or you may need to establish your own procedures. You just need to be sure that you're enrolling students who are eligible under our statute. The frequently asked question document contains a definition of eligible individual if you need a little refresh. I already covered here that a new student must be reported in the NRS when he or she has accumulated 12 contact hours. This is the same as it always has been. There are no changes here. But I would add that as soon as feasible, 
a local program should administer an NRS approved test. And there's more to come on that. Next slide, Jane. So how do I report a student in the NRS that has no NRS approved test score? Because a student must be placed in an educational functioning level in order to report them, we are allowing flexibility in how you can do this during the pandemic when you are unable to administer an NRS approved test. To solve that problem, we created a new concept called provisional placement. You may use other assessment methods to provisionally assign an EFL for the purpose of placing a student uh, in an EFL when an approved test cannot be administered. For example, a state may allow informal assessments that are content driven or performance driven, such as locator tests or criterion reference tests. A state may choose to include crosswalks between informal assessments to EFL levels. Um, but we do urge that local programs administer NRS approved tests as soon as it's fe uh, feasible and go back into your reporting system and adjust that initial provisional EFL placement based on an actual pretest score. Next slide, please. Can a participant achieve measurable skill gain based on a provisionally assigned ESL? Well, yes. Some students may be able to show measurable skill gain using some types of gain available to adult education. Let's go back and measure how a skill gain can be achieved. Next slide. Here is our graphic from the beginning. It's a simple depiction of the types of gains that can be used for adult education. A learner can achieve a measurable skill gain even with the provisional EFL placement except for the test option where that big red X is. While the remaining types of gain may not work well for all learners, some learners may be able to achieve a measurable skill gain using a provisional placement. For example, if they're able to get their high school uh, diploma or whether they accrue credits in a credit bearing program or whether you're able to show that they exited the program and entered a post-secondary education or training program. Next slide, please. A learner cannot achieve an MSG using the EFL test option with a provisional placement. However, if a program can administer an approved NRS test at some point later, the program can change or adjust the provisional placement to one based on the test score. Then, the test option becomes available for use for registering a measurable skill gain. So while the provisional placement is not a panacea, it does allow programs to enroll new students and to meet the requirement to report them in the NRS after they have achieved 12 hours of instruction. This is a slide um, that contains the links of the three program memorandums. Um, that are parts one, two, and three of the frequently asked COVID questions. Um, and the link to the tip sheet on distance learning. I've also provided here a link um, from our links website on COVID-19 support for adult educators that has um, resources in it that are more programmatically focused than reporting focused. So I encourage you to use them and I hope that it's helpful. Okay, the next slide, um, that concludes our, uh, our, our, our presentation portion. Uh, we still have a good amount of time to take uh, some questions. Um, so Jay, take it away. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, hi, everybody, glad to be here today. Um, looks like the first question we have, Cheryl, is from um, George Krupa. It says, why is the measurement only 12 hours? In my experience, extremely few students make a gain after only 12 hours. Um, yeah, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead, take it away. Um, well, you know, the, uh, we, the student becomes a participant reportable in the NRS at the 12 hour mark. Um, the, the time at which you administer a post-test uh, to measure educational functioning level gain is uh, a lot longer than that. It depends on the state's assessment policy, but most of the assessment, uh, the test publishers have that marked at 40 hours at least. 
Um, and so that would be the actual time period where you would measure whether or not a student has made an educational gain. So the 12 hours is really a number that's just used for um, classifying uh, a student, moving them from moving them into the participant status category. That's correct. Um, the next and I, I, that's correct, Jay. And I would also add um, that there, uh, when WIOA passed and we were writing the regulations around performance accountability, each individual uh, program under WIOA had to define who a participant was. And in adult education, we defined a participant as someone who has obtained at least 12 hours of instruction because there are many students who come through programs who are kind of, I'll say, maybe curiosity seekers, and they might only get two or three hours. Um, and over the years, uh, we, we came to believe from talking to a lot of local programs that there really is kind of a, um, a bar at which a student commits to the program. And that's, that's where the basis of that 12 hour rule came. Okay, and then the next question is about the employment indicators. And this person says, it seems quite unfair and negative to look at employment as a performance indicator during a time of deep recession. Do economic factors affect the goals set this area? Um, yes, they, they absolutely do. Um, you know, and I didn't want to get too technical in, in the short amount of time that we had, but the law requires that we use a statistical adjustment model um, at the point in time that we establish the targets. And that model is based on the last available data that we have, the last two years of available data that we have from each state. But then it later requires at the end of the program year, when all of the data is in, it requires that we go back um, in those models and use actual economic character of uh, conditions and actual participant data. So in this way, we believe that the model will be able to adjust performance targets um, for uh, the economic conditions being created um, under COVID, uh, while we're in COVID. Um, we are all watching that with great interest. Um, we are, um, you know, ensuring that every state will get a fair assessment of their performance, considering these unusual circumstances that we are in. Uh, the next question uh, is from Jennifer Brown. She says, do the NRS levels count as educational functioning levels? And yes, the answer to that, yeah. the same thing. Same thing, so, longer yeah. word. Level, educational right. functioning level, equate the same thing. Thank you for asking that question. Next question is from Justin Smith. Uh, he's asking if a student was marked COVID exempt and they did not take an initial assessment, will they still be able to achieve a gain, a skill gain? Specifically, if they obtain their high school equivalency before local programs have a chance to administer a pretest to assign an educational functioning level. That's a good question. Um, and that puts into practice, and we can apply um, the chart that we showed, that students can achieve a measurable skill gain using a provisional, uh, using a provisional placement. And they can achieve that through high school completion. So if you put a student in a provisional placement, that student has 12, more than 12 hours, and you provisionally place them in an educational functioning level, and that student gets their high school diploma, you have a measurable skill gain. Thank you for clarifying. Yep. The next question is about uh, an assessment called CASAS goals. Uh, of course, asks, do we know if CASAS goals will be approved for use with ESL learners? Um, you want to take that one or should I? No, I think you should take that one, Jay. You're the test. Coach. Okay, uh, so <laughs> we, do, we do have a we have a process uh, in our office. We have a process by which we review assessments for use in the National Reporting System for Ed, Adult Education, and um, this is a question about that process. Uh, and we, at this point, uh, our um, our federal register notices about there are several notices out there that have announced the tests are approved for use uh, 
um, in the NRS, both on the ABE side and on the ESL side. Um, and right now, uh, at this point, we have our, I'll call them the legacy ESL tests, the tests that we've always had all along. Those continue to be approved for use in the, in the NRS. And right now, we don't have any new tests yet that are approved for use um, in the ESL program in the NRS that are aligned to those new descriptors, those new ESL descriptors in the NRS. So that is something that is not yet uh, uh, that's not yet available, but right now there are all of those ESL tests that are available currently for use um, in, the, in the NRS. Um, next question is, what will be the expectations for NRS performance for program year 2020 to 2021? So that year that begins next week in Jan on July 1st, um, when, what will be the expectations for NRS performance in the upcoming program year? So this is, um, you know, we have not yet determined that, um, as, as I said earlier in the webinar, and no one really knows what the effect is of COVID is going to be in the, F, in the PY 2020 year. Um, we are all watching it. Um, all of the federal partners um, meet regularly. We are looking at the statistical adjustment model, and we will be um, trying to run that model to determine whether it is indeed adjusting. Um, but these are kind of future questions um, um, that, that we just don't have answers for yet from the perspective of the federal to state relationship. I can't speak for what your state um, expectations are with your local performance, um, but from a federal to a state perspective, we are in a kind of watch and um, see um, kind of status. Mm -hmm. um, Justin Smith asks, uh, how will we report gains on reporting tables without EFL assignments from pretests? So we have this slide still up. I have the slide <laughs> still up. I don't know if you can see it, but I think that's what this question is about. So uh, I, I, the question is about the tables, right, which we're how do we report right. gains? How do we report gains for, for gains. someone? Okay. You can report a gain only if that student has enough credits accrued to move from one level to another. You can report a gain if a student has left your adult education program and entered post-secondary education or training. Or you can register a gain if that student got his high school diploma. They are the three ways that you can register gain um, for a measurable skill gain. Right. I saw a question earlier, can we use GED, uh, I don't have, GED ready to do a provisional placement? Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, that's an example of, a con of, of an assessment that you can use to make a provisional placement if your state allows you to do that. Again, I think that's the question that you need to ask at your state office. Uh, the next question is interesting. So this person asks, so as a teacher, I should not have been evaluated on student performance this past year. Say that again, please. You had, you had mentioned that uh, in this current program year that OCTA is not going to be um, evaluating performance on program year 2019. And this person is saying, oh, well, then I should not have been evaluated on student performance. <laughs> last year. Um, I don't know. That's the question for your local program administrator and for yeah. your state. Um, um, I don't have anything to say about that. Yeah, so it's clearly teacher performance is not something that falls in the federal purview. Um, you know, teacher performance is very much uh, state and or locally determined. Um, so uh, that's an interesting comment. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, the next one is, can you provide the link for the NRS tips adult education participants in distance learning in the chat box or QA box? Um, so I wonder if Sharon, if you, we have a slide uh, on that. I thought we did. There we are. This is the um, NRS tips here uh, in the um, PowerPoint. And um, uh, Sharon, if you could put that in the chat box for this person, the just the link that we have there on this slide for resources. 
Sure. I think, and I think that we're the the uh, the uh, slides will be made available to participants. Correct, Sharon? And so we'll do the, mm -hmm. the link. Okay. There. Yeah, because when you hover over it, you can click on it, and it takes you there too. Oh, there, and somebody somebody linked it for you. Mm -hmm. A lot of tech savvy people um, on that call. Our next question is from Renee Terry. Was the 12 hour rule adjusted for students in correctional facilities who don't have virtual capabilities and are only provided worksheets? So no, the 12 hour rule is a 12 hour rule for all students um, to be considered participants in adult education. So if you're in a correction setting and someone is doing worksheets, if, if the local, if the state is allowing you to use proxy hours and assign hours to the work that that student is completing on worksheets, and you figure that that student has uh, obtained 12 hours, he is a participant and he would go into, uh, you would be responsible for reporting him on the NRS. If the question is, does that constant, does worksheets constitute distance learning in adult education? That's a question I think that you need to have a conversation with your state office about. But I will say that we do understand that uh, correction settings are uh, providing that kind of uh, more primitive instruction, a distance instruction. It's more like a correspondence course. Um, and we know that even in rural areas where there are technology access problems, that some of those low tech uh, solutions are still being used. And that those things are not a problem from the federal perspective because the definition of distance learning is that the student is basically separated um, from the teacher. Right. Uh, the next question is from Haven Marsh. Is the TABE one of the tests which offers virtual testing? Um, Jane, you want to take that one? Yeah, uh, actually, uh, our understanding is that it is. Um, I believe they've gone out with uh, some guidelines for, uh, for states to, um, and local programs to administer the TABE virtually. So uh, what I would say is to contact your um, local TABE representative about that um, to determine what those procedures are and what they put in place to enable that virtual testing. Um, the next question is from Michelle Temperio in Florida. She says, do you think it is possible for Florida to allow GED Ready as a placement? Um, she, and I believe, Cheryl, you answered that question. It is yeah, mm -hmm. provisional placement. Um, and another question is, is provisional, are provisional placements for all states or does this vary by state? We have question. made provisional placements available to all states. Yes. Uh, it might vary by state what that provisional placement process is, though. We have allowed, I mean, states are uh, able to um, determine within their uh, state how that happens, the provisional placements, but it's available nationwide. Megan Kristoff has a question here. How do we indicate EFL for a student in TOPS Pro Enterprise who doesn't have an NRS pretest? Um, that would be that, um, that provisional placement that we talked about um, on uh, slide 22, um, that they can use an, um, uh, any, uh, a state determined uh, process to place a student provisionally um, into an educational function level in the NRS. Um, so I think what's one of the things that's um, kind of foundational to this provisional placement is because the pre post test option is not available to you under a provisional placement. You can use any number of things to place that student in a level on a chart. It, if, if your judgment in it or the assessment, it doesn't have to be precise because you're not moving them a level based on uh, with that as you would on a pretest. So, you know, e even, even teach, we've even had people ask us questions about, well, you know, we served uh, a certain number of students before this rule came out um, and they left, they left now and we don't know how to report them. 
Um, you know, we have even said in situations like that, that even teacher judgment would be a acceptable way to place them provisionally. Because the bottom line is, is you are required to put that student in the reporting system. Now, it doesn't say that you're gonna be able to get a gain for them, but it, you are required to count that student in the system. This is really important to us because without uh, the ability to count, you're required, without the ability to give you something to count those students, and don't forget, they're being measured against other indicators, not just MSG. That's why I went through that in the beginning, is that there are six indicators. Five of those indicators are student-based. So it doesn't matter if they didn't get an MSG or they did get an MSG, we still have to track them for employment. We still have to track them for wages. We still have to track them for credentials. Um, without giving you a way to get that person in the system, you would not be able to meet your program requirements. So uh, I wouldn't get too hung up on the provisional placement being accurate at that EFL. Yes, we would like it to be accurate. But the most important thing is that once your program operations start to um, like loosen up a little bit, um, we have states who are telling us that they're starting to open testing centers again, and they're using social distancing practices. There's appointments, um, there's precautions, there's separations, there's social distancing, there's mask requirements, but students are actually coming into centers and testing again. And so what we're really saying to you is give them a provisional placement, get them in the reporting system and work your very best to try to get a real pretest on them when you can and when it is safe to do. So again, the provisional placement, um, don't get too hung up on how accurate it is because you can't move them a level from a provisional placement unless you're using something else like credits or transition to post-secondary education. Okay. Um, it's, a real, it's a real mind switch for us, um, but this uh, epidemic has, pandemic has made a lot of mind switches occur. Absolutely. Um, the next question comes from Haven Marsh. To count for an MSG via post-secondary entry, does the student need to exit the adult education program? That is, can students who attend high school equivalency classes while taking a college class indicate a measurable school gain? So Chris, so Jay, who wants to give the bad news on that one? You or me? <laughs> well, it's, I, I mean, it's, uh, it's, news. it's exit. I mean, yeah, it's exit. The answer is, the answer is they need to exit um, the adult education program um, and uh, enter post-secondary education. Um, that's, that's the way the uh, measure is written. Um, and, yeah. and there's a reason it's written that way. Um, you know, as we, we went through a very, very rigorous process when these, um, when these rules were made, and, um, you know, allowing adult education to count a measurable skill gain based on post-secondary education, on entrance into post-secondary education, was we had, we had a, the litmus test of it really showing progress. Um, we could not sell co-enrollment uh, where a student would start in two programs as showing progress. So that's why it is um, exit based, so that you show that they finished a program that, and they progressed to a next step, which is post-secondary education. This was a very, very hard um, win for us in, in Octe as we were going through the regulatory process with all of the sign-offs and approvals that we had to get. But we felt very glad and happy that we were able to extend uh, EFL uh, by adding transition to post-secondary education after exit because it has been something that uh, we have been succeeding with. Um, but that's kind of a little bit of the backstory on it. Okay. Uh, Jennifer Brown says, can you please ask, can you please go over again how programs can achieve measurable skill gain with post-tests if we test them as soon as we are approved to do so? Mm -hmm. The same way you always have. Um, you would put that test score, uh, you would level that student based on that test score, and you would start counting your instructional hours from when that test was given. And when you achieve the number of instructional hours 
that your state requires in its assessment policy, you would post test same way as you always did. Uh, so here we have a question from uh, Margaret Giordano. If a student did take a pre-test, pre and post test, and did not make an educational functioning level gain, but did achieve a high school equivalency diploma, is that another way to show a measure, measurable skill gain? If I follow the question, the answer is yes, Jay. I think the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. yes, yes. It's a, they didn't make a gain through pre-post test, but they did get a high school diploma. Got a high school diploma, it's a gain. Mm -hmm. It's a measurable skill gain. Um, and uh, Marilyn Cox has asked me to show the, um, the links page again, which I'm currently doing. Um, Peg Gold says, what is the plan solution for funding increased proctor costs due to remote testing requirements? So the, the, those would be conversations you would need to have with your state office. Your, your state determines what the funding mechanisms are um, between the state and the local program. Um, so you would need to have that conversation there. We don't have um, those sorts of requirements and, and they vary greatly around the country. Mm -hmm. uh, Yelena Zyman says, just to confirm if provisional level placement was used and then adjusted after the pretest was administered, there is no chance to get an immeasurable skill gain? There is. Oh, there is, what yes. she's saying is once they give a pretest, she's saying, is it really no chance? Oh. To, so again, there is a chance. That is sure, the sure. for it. Yeah, you, there's a chance then once you give that pretest to um, achieve a measurable skill gain through a post test. Um, of course, there are those other uh, methods that uh, right. share. Those other, the other options do not go away. So mm -hmm. if you pretested a student, and you know, at the end of the year, you see that that student achieved his high school diploma, you could use the high school diploma option to move that gain, to give that student a measurable skill gain. Mm -hmm. So you're not locked in. Once you give a pretest you, and a post-test, you are not locked into using that method to demonstrate a measurable skill gain. Right. Mike Ellis asks, so based on what you said, the measurable skill gain target for our state for 2020 may be revisited in the future if COVID continues to create chaos with our adult education programming and registration? Yeah, uh, you know, what we, what we would do is we would run the statistical adjustment model at the end of the year to see if it accounts for uh, the COVID or not. Um, and if it doesn't, we would have to make some decisions, um, you know, about how to proceed from there. These are, these are just, I mean, no, no one is going to uh, make policy decisions um, without looking at data with data that hasn't even started yet. Um, but as I said, the assessment will be fair and objective. Um, so I don't think that uh, you're going to see penalties um, given to states because of the pandemic. Um, this question is from Mark Johnson, and I'm not sure how much time we have left. We have a minute left. One method, he asked, one method of measurable skill gain is post-secondary transition. Um, it is ironic that if students are in an education and tr educational training program, they can't get credit or their post-secondary enrollment until or unless they withdraw from adult basic education, which they still may need. Or am I mistaken? You're not mistaken, Mark. You, 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 you know the rule. Um, this, you know, when, we, when these rules were established, um, it underwent a very rigorous process. Uh, people made comments about that. Um, we responded to public comments, and um, it is an exit-based uh, indicator. It's an e exit-based option for the MSG indicator. Yes. Um, I'll just squeeze one more question in here. We, we're at time. Um, and the question is from, is, is actually, it says here anonymous, can you speak to the effectiveness in serving employers indicator? <laughs> Not in three seconds. Um, no. 
No, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's under a pilot phase. Um, there are some options that states have for reporting it. We're not using it um, to look right at this point about performance. Uh, we'd be happy to provide some information to you on that indicator if you reach out to us um, separately. Yeah. But I know that uh, Sharon. And, and your adult education state office uh, will also is involved in the piloting of this indicator in your state. So with that, I just want to thank Jay and Cheryl. Um, my goodness, you've taken 25 minutes of questions here. <laughs> you've done it with such grace. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of the, the folks that took the time to join us. This webinar was recorded. It will be shared out um, within 24 hours. So just look in your inbox. It'll come directly from Zoom. But again, Cheryl and Jay, thank you. We truly appreciate all that you're doing. Appreciate your leadership. And, and thank you again for this webinar. Thank you so much for the opportunity. You. You're so welcome. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. -bye.